All right, Mark Whitfield, how you doing? Man, I'm doing great, Jeff. How are you? Ah, not too bad, all things considered. I guess the, the all things considered sort of has to be the part of the response nowadays, doesn't it? Amen. That's the, uh, it's written at the bottom of the screen on every screen, all things considered. I mean, everything's a phone call and a Zoom now too. They're, like, I haven't seen the people that I work with in, what, eight, nine months now? Yes, I imagine you have been, you've, been, you've converted your entire operation to virtual and, and, and online communication, right? Yeah, I'm able to remote access my work computer. So anything that I can't do from my home computer, I can do remotely through the work computer. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's trippy. You know, like have to have a weekly meeting just to be like, oh, yeah, we, we all work together with other oh, people. You know, by, I would say by the end of April, beginning of May, I was starting to feel like all of my friends and my family and my colleagues and so forth were figments of my imagination. <laughs> wait a minute, like you know what wait a minute like maybe this really wasn't real and if you know and and, and this virtual and this, now i'm just waking up and realizing that all this time i thought i was going out playing music doing concerts was all in my head and this is what life has been like uh it was it's, it's, this isolation was not has not been good what's been interesting is there are people that i used to do business with via email that I'd never had the chance to meet or even see that suddenly I did get to meet and see because that's what everyone was doing. So sure. there's some people who I'm actually meeting when you wouldn't think that I would be. Sure, sure. You know, one thing that I, that I, I will imagine is a good thing to come from this. Um, our flexibility in terms of, uh, you know, being willing to accommodate one another and work with work with these online tools. And a lot of this will remain, uh, I would imagine, uh, and much to our benefit once the world comes back online, so to speak. Uh, no pun, but like once, you know, once, once we can actually, re, you know, there's a lot of this, a lot of convenience and ease to this that I think should remain a part of our lifestyle as we go forward. What I'll be curious to see is from a jobs perspective is the, there's a lot of companies now who are saying even after this is over, they're going to allow staff employees to work from home. But then that also opens up you a work to a workforce that's not in your direct city. So you can be a New York City based company and potentially have employees that are in Topeka. Because yeah. what's the difference if you're all working remotely? Well, I, I, you know, the thing about that is, is you know, my wife, for instance, is someone who's worked. Uh, off and on for years from home in 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 her business. She she was um, the VP of the mortgage division of a home builder here in the area for years. And now she's VP of sales for these for several uh, home builders in Florida. And so we've actually been commuting. Well, we have been commuting as of late. But for for the last few years, we we commute back and forth uh, uh, to Florida. Uh, I I still live here in Jersey, and we have a place there. And so. Um, Work, but work from home was a, was a delicate issue because it just meant working by phone. And so mm -hmm. you could say you were working from home, <laughs> but you know, they, was, since it, so much of it was not was it was not inclusive of the video aspect. Uh, her, you know, she as a boss was never sure. But now that you can actually you know t click on the screen and see who's working and see what's going on, um, and sort of police your employees that way, I wouldn't be surprised if, if this if this remains a major part you know, of, of our workforce and work systems going forward. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the sort of the open office became the really hot thing like five, ten years ago. Now maybe this will be the new thing even after this is over. Uh, yeah, because I mean, Chesky, we, the issue now is that we've sort of already recorded, we've put out everything that we've recorded. So the next thing we'll be figuring out, what do we record next? Right, sure, sure. So during this, a lot of my stuff's been trying to figure out tr ways to maximize stuff I already have shine a light on stuff that's already been released, talk to artists, see what they're up to, because obviously you can't go out and be touring. So it's just like try to keep, you know, on keep in front of people as much as possible. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Uh, you know, it's funny. I, I um, like so many artists, you know, I, I especially some, you know, I'm in my 50s now. And I've, I've done nothing really but tour uh, and perform, whether it's locally or, or abroad. Um, since the late 80s. Uh, uh, and so it's all I ever really could, thought about doing. I'm not much of an entrepreneur or business-minded person. I just like to play guitar. And so uh, that was always good enough for me. Um, and I've had a pretty good life and a pretty good career, uh, um, you know, as a result of that. Uh, so once I got over the depressing uh, uh, real, you know, realization that 
that was going to, you know, on hold indefinitely. Um, I just try to figure out how to continue uh, um, being creative. And part of what fuels my creative energy is looking into the faces of people that, that I, you know, who want to hear music. And, 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 and so that exchange of energy and ideas is kind of what fuels the next project and keeps me going. Um, and I think, you know, the pressure uh, right away, we were all like, okay, well, I'll just perform online and you guys can pay to watch me at my house, you know, and, and then you realize, and then after a while I realized, well, this is horrible. Like, I, I feel bad um, turning something so casual into trying to monetize a very casual musical. Like, I still want people to be able to watch me play. And, but Instagram has always been something, you know, or Facebook or these things have always been ways, uh, tools to connect so that we can arrange to get together or, you know, promote performances and, and things like that. Uh, and it seemed to be, it seemed to be a little disingenuous that we're going to start immediately turning these into, into trying to monetize it and turn it, turn it into avenues for artists to, to survive. And so the challenge there has become is, well, what do I do to continue to create and uh, produce music uh, that I can, that, that I can sell and, and survive from, while still engaging people in a very genuine way. And, and so I've turned to uh, um, teaching and doing, and doing a lot of masterclass work, um, which is a really, which is, a, which is perfect for this setting. So, uh, uh, you know, I work with the Guitar, Ma Guitar Mastery Intensive Program out of California, and they, they, uh, um, it's a very sort of boutique tailored program and it, it takes students from all over the world. And so I've got a, a pretty full load of students um, and basically they have a core curriculum that the students are responsible for. And I, I get, to, I have to watch some videos of the students playing the scales and things. And then they get a 30 or 50 minute uh, a mentor session with me where I get, where I share, you know, uh, um, the benefit of my experience and my, and my musicianship with them in a one-on-one -on -one situation. And I'm, I'm loving it. I, you know, I never really was a fan of, of, of uh, I taught at Berkeley for a little while while my students were going there. And I would, while my, my kids were going there, while I would have done anything to help facilitate them going to college and, and also keep an eye on them. Teaching at, at Berkeley wasn't really, a, wasn't really that great for me. Um, I felt like I was just part of a really big machine and the students, most of the students could have, uh, they could have had lessons for me or the mailman. It didn't really, you know, it didn't really matter who they were studying, what they were, what they were doing. Uh, uh, and well, you know, it was always, it's always, the money was, it was always good to make money. It just, um, I'm someone who would much rather find something that I enjoy to do and, make, and, 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 and have that make money than just take money for something I don't really enjoy, uh, given that option, of course. Um, and so this has been great. Uh, I, I do a couple of master classes where, I, where I, we gather, you know, 15, 20, 20 students of all ages and we tackle specific, specific uh, um, problems or issues, you know, chord melodies or just very things specific to guitar. And, and then I do other things where I talk about my career and the people that I've worked with. Um, and I teach these lessons and that takes care of keeping me financially afloat, keeps, you know, keeps the lights on and, and keeps my wife from yelling at me, which is important. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the, and then, and, and, but, you know, that also gives me a real, a wonderfully positive, you know, energy that I can share with people when I do when I do things like this, or when I um, post videos to Instagram, or do things to connect with people to to sort of. And I do I do it mostly just so that I can I I don't have to, I don't give into that feeling of being isolated again. You know, I I'm a very sort of just a naturally social person. You know, this is spending time. Right? I mean, I never shut up. I never stop. <laughs> you know, I love that. I, that's my. That's just my natural. That's my default setting. And so, um, having having a way to connect with people and getting some feedback, and and um, it's also given me to a way to connect with people uh, personally in a way that I, you know, folks like like uh, that I would never have known. Like you mentioned, you're dealing with you know with, with business partners now that you'd never actually see. It was all just online. And, blah, right. blah, blah, blah. and so I've got, you know, students and, 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 and young musicians that I'm mentoring from around the world. Like a couple of guys in, in, in Lisbon and some guys in the UK and a couple of kids in Hong Kong. And, and uh, you know, and, and sometimes they just want to log on and talk to me about their struggles you know, living, just dealing with, you know, with our current situation. Mm -hmm. 
And I wouldn't have taken it so seriously uh, a few months ago, but it, it, you know, it's become painfully obvious to all of us that uh, even in, you know, in lieu of, uh, a, uh, you know, a, a, a cure or a vaccine being around the corner, the actual, you know, the production and the distribution of that, you know, in, 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 in mass, in, in the sort of mass quantities that will, that will allow us to get back to life. We're still, you know, eight, 12, 16, 18 months away from going back to life, going back to our lives, uh, Corona free. And so uh, uh, um, I realize now that what we could do, things that we can do, whatever we can do to add, uh, add some quality to one another's lives, in these formats is really important and, I, and I'm really glad to be to be a part uh, to feel like I'm, I'm able to make some sort of positive impact in that way you know I think what's cool about sort of a great equalizing nature of all of this is whether it's a digital show or giving lessons you're now competing with people from or you're getting access to an audience across the world that you might not otherwise because when we had concerts to go to you're limited to what town am I in those right. are the people that can that are going to come watch but if it's I can't go see anybody in person, then suddenly right. anybody in the world is now open to me as well. It's all the same as far as I'm watching it from my house. Now it's who do I want to watch? doesn't matter where they're playing. Yeah. And I, I have um, had the benefit of that from an audience perspective even. You know, like I, I, uh, I haven't had the opportunity to see John McLaughlin play in years. And, you know, early on he was doing, you know, little shows from his, from the loft in his house. I, you know, I, you know, and so I, I was sitting in front of my computer screen, like a geek, geeking out like a fan, you know, and, and, uh, um, you know, and I'm very close to Kevin Eubanks and George Benson, two guys who, two, you know, legends who, who at different times, and you know, played very important parts in my life, uh, um, in my development. And so sometimes, uh, uh, like I, I got so, it's funny, I hadn't performed in, in a while in front of people. And, and uh, uh, so back in, I think this was maybe uh, early July, there was, it was a, 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 a place, a church in Chelsea with a, with a nice courtyard as a school there. And they were putting on some jazz, jazz concerts. Uh, and this guy, uh, a great saxophone player, Nick Hampton, asked me if I would join him for a concert. And I was actually nervous. I hadn't, I was like, man, I, you know, I'm, got, I'm getting dressed and putting on big boy clothes. And I, you know, I'm going to get my amplifier, my stuff together and put them in the car. And I was nervous. So I called, uh, I called Kevin, he, he's in, in LA and talked to him for a little while. Then I called George Benson. He said, you know, and I, and I was like, man, I'm, I'm going to do a concert today. <laughs> well, you know, wow. And, and, and uh, it was just interesting. To, 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 to get to, you know, to, to, to two of my heroes, guys, like I said, who were extremely generous with their wisdom and time and, and, and things with me when I was young and really in need of some help, some guidance. Um, uh, you know, to, to hear their words of encouragement. Uh, uh, and it's nice, to, especially to speak to older guys as I'm quickly becoming one. Uh, it's easy to think of things in terms of, well, how much time do we have? You know, how, how, much, do we, how much time do I have? to accomplish my goals or, or to, you know, to, to do all these things and connect with people and, 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 and what, you know, um, with them, I realized that, you know, it, it, it much more Zen approach is just, it's not, you stop looking ahead to what, what we can cram into what we see happen, happening next and really focus on on getting them on, on making the, the biggest impact of what you you know in in, in the present in, in the be, really being in the moment and 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 understanding the value of it. and and uh, that slowed me down right away I was like oh, oh yeah okay so uh, take the pressure off of uh, today's performance in terms of thinking about well if you don't do so well are people going to say gee he's lost it, it you know that, that not as good as he used to be we probably won't go see him again and stop worrying about what's going to happen next and just go and share some love with these people who are coming out today because for people to come to the concert they had to log on they had to log on to some website show that they had been tested and, and, and you know pay it and then sit you know there were it was a there were a lot thank goodness a lot of a lot of steps to take to ensure we can have a safe outdoor performance and so, uh, um, just where was this? This, this was uh, in Chelsea. This was uh, in, in mid July. Uh, I forget the name of the venue, but it's just a, a, a church school there. They have a huge uh, courtyard on 10th between I think it's 24th and 25th, something like that. Uh, and uh, um, 
and it was great. You know, we had a nice, nice thing. A lot of people turned up and they, they, they maintained our social distancing and all that. Uh, um, I knew that those situations, it's unrealistic to think that those situations were going to last. Uh, um, but it was nice to be able to do it. I think that was one good thing about the summer is that we, that we all did as much as we could to, to take advantage of playing outside, and performing for people and doing things. But in lieu of a cure or a vaccine, uh, um, you, know, you, you know that the prohibitive winters, uh, you know, the weather, weather because of the, of the way it was going to prohibit us from continuing to do that, and, we, and it's just not safe for us all to gather inside. I mean, how, how do you socially distance in smalls? Like, you know, I mean, they're trying, but, you know, the, the, not socially distant is built into the name, <laughs> right? Like, it's just, you know, and, and I don't care if it's Carnegie Hall. Like, you just, it's, it's hard to ensure that, uh, it's difficult to ensure that uh, we're going to be able to, uh, to, you know, keep each other safe and maintain distance and so forth like that and keep things clean and, and all that. So this, uh, you know, these opportunities to interface and talk and come and come together are really valuable, which is why I'm so glad you asked me to do this today. Yeah, I mean, it's hard not like you got to try to remain optimistic. But when I think about the music venues in the city and how long they've been down, yeah. it is. I know that what they they can't be evicted right now is the thing. But I'm curious after that ends, how many of them are going to end up closing down? Sure, I can't even imagine the debt. Uh, uh, and, you know, and like anything else, a lot of these places, excuse me, a lot of places require a lot of maintenance uh, mm -hmm. and upkeep because we're talking, I mean, the, you know, places like the Vanguard, these places these, in buildings that are, you know, 70, 80, 100 years old, you know, pre-war construction, things like that. And so uh, these venues require a lot of constant maintenance and upkeep just to, uh, um, uh, just to stay viable. Uh, 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 and, and, and usable. Um, and so having been down, uh, like a place like Mesro, I'm sure no one's even been in there. You know, I know they've been using smalls, but Mesro has been shut down for months. And so the amount of money that it would cost the people that own it to get it back up and running, where's that going to come from? You know, and, 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 uh, and so I, um, that's a sad thought, you know, I'm sure that when the time comes, there'll be a lot of, uh, um, benevolent uh, uh, donors who would like to, you know, just try to help keep these places going. But I think, um, unfortunately, we're witnessing, if not the end of an era, certainly uh, uh, a, sh a sharp transition in, in what our live venues and music scene will be like. Um, and, I, and I think, uh, 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 you know, that we're, we're looking at, at um, at a, at, a, at a vast unknown in terms of the construct of how, how, we, how we rebuild the music scene and how, how we go about uh, meeting new musicians and, and assessing new talent and finding places to perform and how that's going to go about. Uh, um, I don't think we'll be able to shake the feeling of what this has been like for quite some time. I mean, even under the best of circumstances, the economics of running a music venue in New York City weren't easy. And even when the prospect was, okay, we'll do it 25% capacity. It's like, in a lot of cases, that's worse for people. Sure. Be because now, okay, well, now I've got to pay staff. Whereas if we were just closed, I'm not paying staff. Right, exactly. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I saw that at the Blue Note. There, they were, uh, some guys were advertised that they're going to start performing there, and, you know, and they get uh, 25%. And I'm just thinking, man, like, you know, the Blue Note, they have that entire building. Mm. Just, just to just to have staff enough staff to to keep it to have it clean, sound, everything ready. I mean, you know, and you're only selling. To, I mean, imagine the ticket price <laughs> if if you're even hoping to break to even come close to breaking even on a day's performance. And so, uh, um, uh, I got to be honest, I wouldn't expect anybody to pay three hundred dollars to you know to bring a date to come see me play a jazz guitar for an hour. Like, <laughs> I got. I tell you what, stay home, log on. I'll do a Zoom thing. You know, we'll do it for two fifty. Uh, uh, um, I don't, you know, and, and I'm not sure how good I feel about going there to play. Like I just, you know, not not to sing off the blood, you know, I, but I just like in general, you know, like, uh, mm. um, there are places like you know, I, I do. I have been playing once a month at the Roxy, you know, the, 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 the Roxy in Tribeca. They closed the Django downstairs, which is a good thing. But the Roxy uh, has a, a, a huge open space 
in the in the in the lobby of the hotel, and so they did great stage. They've always had music there. It was great sound, and and distancing is, is, is the place was already set up with very sparse seating and tables, and so it's, it works out really nice. They take reservations. They keep everyone way more than six feet apart. And you can, as an artist, you kind of walk in, walk on stage, you play, you walk out. You know, it's, 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 and so there's a lot of, lot of um, I feel safe, you know, and secure in that in that situation. Um, but that's, but how odd is that in in New York City, especially you know, to have a venue where there's so much space. That's the thing, you know, we we want all, you know, our clubs are always, you know, you, you and your date are sitting at a table with someone else at their date. You know, right. it's, you know, just, that's just kind of how we do it. You know, and, and so. Um, yeah, a lot of that is uh, is, is, is 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 up in the air for sure. Yeah, I've been on some first dates in in like the in a jazz club type scenario, and sometimes it's awkward because it's like the person, the couple next to you is married and they know each other, so they're clearly just like you can tell they're not like super eavesdropping, but they're they're, they co- are, they're kind of entertained by <laughs> the first date that's happening immediately to their right. And you're like, oh, this is this is dinner and a show before right, the show right. starts. And I- and my wife and I have been that old married couple who, try, you know, who really tried not to, you know what I mean, to make because you know we all remember what it's like to be on that you know, that awkward first date where, where really what you want is you want some privacy so that just you know for for those few moments when you weren't at your best you don't feel like someone everybody else had to see. <laughs> <laughs> not only did I strike out, but there was an audience. Fantastic. Right, right, exactly. So I struck out for everyone to see. Awesome. I'm somebody else's you know, <laughs> time story later this week, you know. Oh, man. But I tell you what, though, uh, faced with uh, our current situation, how do we, how much do we miss uh, the prospect of all that? You know, like just, I would take sitting at a table with a couple on their first date any day of the week and say, and we can all go back to that tomorrow. You know what I mean? Like, please give it back to me, you know. Right. So taking it back even further to, I mean, you've had a very long career. Um, the first time that you signed with your, your major label debut, how does that come to be? Um, okay. So I, I was playing around uh, uh, traveling with, with, uh, as a member of Jack McDuff's organ group. Um, and we had a gig that he didn't, uh, he wasn't so excited about. It was a place in Midtown called the Lone Star Roadhouse. Uh, and Jack didn't, didn't really like to come downtown. Uh, he liked to play in Harlem and then in tour. But I guess it was money, you know, but he couldn't. So we were playing at this place called the Lone Star Roadhouse. Now, at the same time, um, I had met and befriended George Benson, which is sort of how I'd come, you know, he, he suggested that I go play with Jack. Actually, I met George at the Blue Note. Um, the whole story is we were, uh, it was, the Blue Note was, was celebrating their sixth anniversary in their current location. So this was October of 1987. And I was playing uh, there in the late night jam session band with Philip Harper and Justin Robinson. Uh, uh, we, played five, we played six nights a week from 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. for $15. Uh, and I was 20 years old, just out of Berkeley and glad to get it. I worked a day job on Wall Street. So whatever, I was playing every night. And so for their anniversary week, they were going to have uh, Billy Eckstein and his band. They were hosting, he was hosting the week. And his special guests were Tony Bennett and Sarah Vaughn. Uh, and so I guess he didn't find anybody else good or legendary. Right? <laughs> so, um, they, were, they were changing the format for the, for, the, for the anniversary celebration. They were going to have continuous music starting around 7 o'clock and going until 2 or 3 in the morning. And so whenever he took a break... Uh, whenever uh, Mr. Eckstein took a break with his band and all that, they just send us up. You know, it's the late night, but we just play, play for a half an hour, just kind of keep things going. And uh, um, George Benson showed up. Uh, uh, he and his wife walked in. Uh, uh, they were on the. They just showed up as guests, uh, and he wanted to sit in and play a song, uh, but didn't have his guitar. And so the. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Danny Ben Susan, AK to me, said, Hey, you know, George Benson is here. Can you please? I was like, Of course he can, but can I meet him? You please can I just introduce me. So I walked over and, and, and I handed George my guitar and he started playing it. And he said, Man, I love this. This is one of those lawsuit Ibanez models. Every time I see one of these, I buy it. And I was like, uh, Yeah, that's the only one I got. So, <laughs> <laughs> so like, uh, Not this time. Yeah, no, you can't buy that one. And so he's just playing, and, and I can, I'm speechless because, you know, he's just kind of warming up because he's getting ready to take the stage and play with Sarah Ron, right? So, so uh, he's, you know, blazing, and I'm looking at him with my jaw dropped, and, and his wife says, Well, I guess uh, 
that's it for you tonight, huh, young fella? Like, yeah, you won't be playing tonight. I was just like, no, nah, please don't make me play after this, you know. And so I, <laughs> and I sat with her uh, 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 while George played. And, uh, of course, it was wonderful. He played, I never he played Billy's Bounce and he played What's New. And when he was done, he came down and uh, people were going nuts and he handed me the guitar. And right on cue, of course, it was time for the, for the main act to take a break, which meant it was now my turn to go on stage. Like, this couldn't be any worse, right? Uh, and so I said, uh, uh, he said, well, listen, relax, uh, young fella, man. thank you, your guitar feels great. But my wife and I have another, uh, we have another commitment. So I won't be able to, to hear you play tonight, but I, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll catch up. I'm sure I'll see you somewhere. You know, uh, um, uh, but he didn't leave. He just, he they stood by the by the door, which you know, from the blue note, if you know, you're on the stage, you can't see who's standing by the door. And right. Just, so I wouldn't be nervous. Listen to me play. And he left me a note that he liked what he heard, and I would see him the following week, which was, um, you know, I, he, I was inspired by his presence and relieved because he left. And so I probably played better than I had played my entire life for that t- 10 or 15 minutes. So George caught my best, right? And so he was impressed. He came back the following week when we were playing our regular late night thing and we talked a bit. He said, well, listen, I'm going on tour. When I, when I come back in a month or so, I'm going to take you up town to Harlem uh, 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 and uh, introduce you to, to brother Jack McDuff because you need to play with him. Play with these, with, your, with these young guys, with your contemporaries. It's great, but you got to be around the older guys who will hold you to a higher standard and, it, and, 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 and they, you know, they'll bark at you in such a way where you'll realize that you know, uh, uh, less than your best at all times is just not accepted. Uh, uh, and then he split. But you know, me being impatient, I wasn't about to wait a month and a half. I found, made some calls and found out where Jack was playing. I was up there the next night. And I just so happens his guitar player was quitting. Uh, uh, and uh, he said, uh, he said, oh, you know, well, you know, I'm gonna uh, give you a shot. You know, come by my house tomorrow. Said, Bring your guitar, we'll see what you can do. And so when I got there, he asked me if I, he said, well, can you read? I'm like, yeah, you know, I can read fine. He's like, all right. And then he took out the stack of charts. But man, the, the charts have coffee stains, barbecue <laughs> sauce, and bullet holes. And, you, know, I mean, you know, like it was, the charts were an approximation of the music. It's just, they were well written, but they just were not very well preserved. And so uh, um, he said, all right, well, yeah, you know, you sound pretty good. You, got, you get through what you said, but there's a lot of stuff that we've added to this that I'm just, I don't have the time to teach you. So now, so now I, I was living in Fort Greene. So I'd taken the subway with my stuff all the way to Harlem. Uh, you know, uh, Lennox, Lennox Terrace is where Jack lived. And he said, but now you have, if you can get uh, the saxophone player, uh, wonderful Andrew Beals, so if you can get Andrew to teach you sort of the subtle things that are missing, you can join us this weekend. And this was maybe, this was maybe Wednesday. And so you can join us tomorrow night. So I called Andrew from Jack's apartment. Uh, uh, and Andrew and his, uh, and his uh, wife at the time, a uh, wife, they, they lived out in, in Greenpoint at the time, right? So Andrew's like, oh God, another guitar player, Jesus, this is like the eighth time. He's like, but you know, cut sure. If you, if you can get out to my place in the next 45 minutes or so, whatever it is, and we can go over the stuff today. So then I jumped on the train and I went straight, you know, I went out to his place in Greenpoint and, and uh, he liked me, thank goodness. And so he took, I took extra time uh, giving me uh, all the tips I needed to survive. And so uh, the next night I joined the band and I was excited. I was like, hey, this is great. When George Benson gets back in town, I'll have a surprise for him. But Jack fired me the first night. Wow. And he's like, we got, got, to, got to the end. He was like, yeah, you're fine. And I was like, and, I, and, it, and it hadn't gone that bad. I was like, you know, I'm like, I'm fired. He's like, and he says, you're fired. But tomorrow night, what I want you to do is blah, 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 blah. So <laughs> what he meant was I was on like this, extended probation like every night like don't think you basically don't don't get comfortable don't think you've got the job yet i don't know if i like you yet so if you if you can you know tweak this and add this and do this by tomorrow and, and, and these things and so he fired me every night for a couple of weeks basically <laughs> you just actually say the words you're fine and you kind of you kind of chuckle a little bit uh, but i never felt like he was joking so i i never i was never like oh he's just kidding no no no, no. He, i could have you know i would he'd say you're fired and i was always waiting for him to say but tomorrow night and so it worked it went like that uh and by you know a month or so not only was i grooving in the band but i had worked up uh, um a nice little following amongst his fans. You know, this young guy kind of played like George and Grant Green and that, you know, and, and I, and I, and, and so they, they, uh, they had, they had welcomed me into the, into that, into that music, musical family up there, you know, at Showman's, we played at Showman's, you know, uh, um, and I looked like I was 12, so you know, they wouldn't even serve me a drink, you know, uh, uh, not that I would have had one, even though I probably needed one. So anyway, George comes in uh, and typical George Benson, superstar style, 
he was on the airplane and he called the club from the from the airplane or the, you know the, on the, on the phone on the, and, and behind, you used to have those phones in the seat behind you see and so he called to tease like uh, uh, just to show off and tease Jack he's like yeah I want to play and I'm coming in and, and man I'm coming straight uptown to hang out with you and I got somebody I'm going to tell you about and he's telling Jack this on the phone Jack, Jack's on the landline at the club right so uh, George shows up and he parked his Rolls Royce on the sidewalk Right, I, I, why not? We should nobody scratches it, right? And, and and he came in, and and much to his surprise, I was already there. So uh, um, he invited me out to his house the next day, and I started going out to his place in Englewood, uh, you know, a couple of days a week, couple couple of, a couple of days a month, whatever, and, and you know, study with him and talk, and and he and he uh, had a great recording studio in his basement. So he recorded a series of demos with me and uh, guys like Donald Harris and Kenny Davis and, and Reg Lavelle, but you know, and, and he was eventually going to going to met Tommy, uh, Tommy the Puma here that's from Warner Brothers. At the same time, go back to this earlier story with Jack and Jeff. Now that I'm in the band, we, we went to Europe. We came back. We're in a nice group. We're going to play this place called the Lone Star Roadhouse. And um, we, after the first set, which went really well. Uh, uh, a guy came up with a suit and tie. He says, "Hi, my name is Charlie Feldman. I, you know, I work for BMI. Uh, man, I, you know, I think you got something special. I'd like to introduce you to somebody." And, and so he handed me his card, told me to come by the next day, come by the office. And so I called him, went by, and signed me up to BMI because I was writing some songs. And, and Charlie had, was a Nashville guy who had brought, come up to work for BMI, and they had given him the, the task of building the jazz department. Because I guess at that point, most jazz guys were at ASCAP, right? I, I wouldn't have known anything about that. I was just getting started, right? So he signed me and introduced me to a guy who would become my manager, a guy named Paul Tannen. Now, Paul Tannen, uh, uh, Paul uh, had worked for Lester Sills. And he was an executive at Screen Gems Publishing for years. And his brother, Michael, was, a, was an attorney, uh, a pretty high-powered music attorney. Who were, and they were both friends with Mo Austin, who was the president of Warner Brothers, right? Uh, um, and really, really close with Mo. And so they, they paid for me to go in and do a demo. Uh, uh, I recorded it, my, my first demo at RCA, you know, the classic RCA studios. It was at 44th and 44th. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they sent it in. And uh, Tommy LaPuma was just getting ready to sign somebody else. He was looking for another young guitar player. He got my demo the day before. Uh, and he listened to it. And he played it for Miles Davis over the phone. Wow. And he said, uh, and so he said that Miles said, I like that, I like that guitar player. Yeah, he sounds like, got some, you know, I, whatever, I mean, I just can't, you know, kind of just like, you got it. To me, it seems so surreal, right? And so Paul called and said, okay, listen, you got to come. We're having, we're having a meeting tomorrow night at 7.30 in Tommy LaPuma's office in the city. You know, uh, uh, and so I, sh I walk in and there's Mo Austin, the president of the label, and my, you know, and my, my manager, Paul, his brother, Michael, who was the attorney, Tommy LaPuma. And they put my demo on with me sitting there, <laughs> right? He's like, come on, right? It was my, I, I had Henry Butler playing, the great Henry Butler uh, playing piano, and Reg uh, uh playing bass, Troy Davis playing drums. And so they're listening to my demo. And, uh, and as it's going, you know, Mo Austin got his eyes closed and he's bopping. I'm like, no, this is, this is you know, and he, and he, and he you know, after my guitar solo, he press, he's, it's a tape recorder, right? He, he presses, so he, he turns the tape off and he says, okay, we want to sign you. And I was like, great, but, uh, what, okay. Like, I'm just, what do I say next? And so, <laughs> uh, before I could say the wrong thing, Michael, uh, Michael Tannen, the attorney, he said, all right, we want, we want this, 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 and this. We want this much money, blah, 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 blah. He says, great, we'll do that. Uh, but I, before we do anything, I want to take him into the studio. And he said, and he said, and by the way, it, uh, 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 when you see George, give him a hug because George told me, tell me about you for months. And tell me he's been recording. He says, you know, I don't know if I trust George in his recording studio. He said, but, he, but your name was in my, was always, I listened to your demo when they sent it because George had been mentioning your name to me. And so all of these things, these two, these two storylines converged just at the right time for, you know, in, in the nick of time for me to get signed before time slot away to someone else. And so uh, a, few, a few weeks later, we went into Electric Lady on 8th, uh, and I took uh, Cyrus Chestnut and some guitars, and these guys, the guys I had gone to school with, we made a demo tape, and, and that, was, uh, that was the precursor to my to recording of my first record, which was The Marksman from Warner Brothers. Uh, and so that, you know, that's, that's how it all started. And I had a few record deal with Warner's, uh, and I would have stayed there forever. But unfortunately, Tommy was, was um, 
time of the Puma was in flux. He he was all he had been there for years. Obviously, all those classic recordings and wonders he did for all those great artists. And he was on his way over to Electra to work. With, um, he was leaving the Warners, and it was you know those the labels were connected and somewhat uh, uh, incestuous. But it was but he wasn't going to keep producing me as an artist once he left, and so. I never really found a new home. That was, you know, I made two more records, which I, which I loved. Was, you know, uh, uh, um, with Matt Pearson and uh, uh, and Ricky. Uh, Jesus, God, Ricky, please don't. Uh, 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 oh well, I forgot to say. Uh, um, and our guys, they were great. They treated me well. But um, what the, what my, but the vision for my for the path, of, you know, my creative it was kind of skewed, and so uh, I went over to Verve. Uh, as Richard Seidel was putting together that roster, you know, with guy, with my friends, with Dick Bride and Roy Hargrove and those guys, and that, and that became, you know, the launching pad for for me to develop into the guy that I am. Uh, um, and so, uh, uh, and then a little bit later, Matt Pearson signed Josh Redman and Kenny Garrett, and so uh, 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 it started building, you know, at Wallace Roney, and started building a, a roster at Warner's that I would have loved to have been a part of. Uh, it was just the timing didn't work out, you know. But uh, Tommy Lapuma was just a great, just a great guy, really nice man, uh, uh, and he believed he was one of those people that uh, believed that um, the you know the only way to to make music, to create music, was to was to was to set was to put an artist in a situation where you felt where you at, you were at your best. So so you know so many guys, well, you know, there's lots of great. It's just. You know, literally thousands and thousands of great jazz recordings made over the last 20, 30, 40 years, however long you want to go back. But so many of these, re of these recordings, especially in the 80s and 90s, were made under the pressure of, you know, very you know, small budgets and very little, t you know, and, and, and a lot of pressure to get a lot, get a lot done in, in, in a little bit of time. And, and, that's, and that's understandable because, of the, because of, of, of the amount of money that revenue that it brings in and, and so forth. But Tommy, since he had access to all of this, all, all of this, uh, um, all this support system from, you know, having been a legend of a major label, he, he put me in a situation where I, I felt really comfortable and, very, and not pressured. And so that's why I think uh, when, I, when I listened back occasionally to The Marksman, uh, which was, you know, literally 30 years ago, um, it, it captured me playing even probably better than I played normally at that time. Because in a situation where I should have been really stressed and worried and nervous and all these things, I could just kind of breathe, breathe easy and play. You know, he, he uh, arranged for me to use these amplifiers that had been custom made for Robin Ford, um, which I think now are valued at seventy thousand dollars, something ridiculous like that. But they, you know, at, at the time, it just meant that I, every note I played sounded magical. And of course, the great Al Schmidt was the engineer, so he captured everything perfectly. And, uh, we had we were recording in Studio A at the power station, so we had you know time in three or four days to record these you know these nine songs, and, and it was just uh, um, it was great, you know. And and, and uh, there's there were a lot of examples. Diana Krall being one, you know, someone a, a, an artist who had been kind of flailing about trying to find a way, you know, to to break through, and then you know, uh, unfortunately, kind of crosses paths cross crosses paths with Tommy and put, puts you in a situation where he can, where you can just deliver your best. And 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 as you know, early on in your career, like for instance, you know, making making those recordings with you guys, where I was, you know, when you say, okay, we're just gonna put you on stage and play, you know, or put, or put you in front of, you know, set you up in front of the HD microphone and we're gonna capture what we capture. I wouldn't have been, you know, confident in my ability to deliver like that. If I hadn't first had the opportunity to establish myself uh, and 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 build a base for myself, not not a, 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 a fan base, but just a, a musical base, like just a, you know, had the had a few really successful attempts at recording to build my confidence and 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 look back and say, okay, this is what my best sound like. Then how do I grow? What do I do? How do I how do I take go from this kid into developing into an artist where I can just walk in and you can say, okay. We're, we're gonna press record and we, we want your best now. And, and I'm confident in delivering, you know? And so I'm really grateful for those opportunities because without them, I think I would, I would, I would have struggled uh, later on in, in my career in ways that I, I just didn't have to worry about. Were your first sessions with Chesky the, the live ones from Rockwood? Cause I know you and yeah. I had met at a session before that, but I didn't know if yes. you had done anything from prior. 
No, not not we well, we met with with with, with Jillian, but I, I right. but, 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 but recorded. But those those uh, um, I was referring to uh, uh, the trio session with with uh, uh, with Ben Allison and Billy Drummond, and then right. of course Camille, uh, because that was um, I had a blast. But I just remember uh, 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 a friend of mine, you know, the great flautist, uh, Ann Drummond, was there, and she was like, "Wow, that would be so nerve wracking to have to play, uh, uh, you know." live because she she and her mom came to the rockwood for that recording session oh she was there she was there yeah she, they were, oh wow we had a few people in the audience right? so Anne and her mom was sitting there she got uh, to see what she was gonna eventually have to do yeah she, right exactly you know she and i we've been friends for, for years and so i was it was it was comforting to see some see some you know friendly faces in the audience so she but that i remember she she remarked that um uh, she would they thought, wow, that must be so nerve wracking to have been placed in a place, you know, at the, uh, separated on this, you know, in the room so that, you know, for, for the benefit of the balance of the recording and so forth. Uh, and actually, I said, no, it, was, it, it felt like a dream. I'm playing with guys who's playing I love, the guys that I respect. We're playing music that, 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 that comes easy to us. Uh, uh, and um, it sounds amazing. I mean, it just sounds, it just, it, it, for every note that everyone played felt and sounded great. And I was a pro, and I was able to approach it with the confidence that I had developed from years and years of you know of playing and recording. So I was and I was in no way. Not only was I not nervous, but I think I was able to help Camille, you know, kind of relax just just by not um, not uh, pressuring her with my own insecurities. You know, I was just like, hey, whatever you need, I got you. I'll play. You know, and so uh, uh, those situations um, and and that was a learning situation for me. Uh, one that I, that, but I, when I look back, when I listen back to Live and Uncut, which is my, you know, my, my the, the trio portion of that recording, man, I don't, I, I wouldn't change a note or a thing. It's just, I'm just like, man, I, you know, I remember, I remember seeing, you know, everyone seemed to love it except this one reviewer who was like, ah, you know, uh, they, they said they didn't really rehearse. Maybe they should have rehearsed. And I was like, well, bro, you just didn't, you missed it. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. Like, I'm listening back. Like, I've been playing guitar in the house since 1973. And so I'm listening back and I'm thinking, man, that's some pretty good guitar playing. Like, I, I'm, I'm still pretty, you know, I'm proud of the way that I played and the way that we worked as a trio. It was our first time, I'm, me and Billy Drummond go back 30 years. And actually, I'd known Ben Allison for, but we'd never worked together as a trio. So, right. um, and in such and in such a unique sort of uh, uh, under the microscope situation because that you know the recording technology is so compl- is so specifically you know sensitive and picks up everything, all the subtleties which can be beautiful or it can be exposing or, or both you know and so uh, I'm very proud of that of that session and that you know and that and that uh, um, and our performance in, in that situation and so uh, but I but I I I, I thank Tommy and Al Schmidt for their love and support. Uh, uh, um, and you know, and, t- and it wasn't always hearts and flowers. I mean, I remember Tommy walking at the guitar, room, you know, stopping his foot and go, what the, f- you did, you, are you kidding me? We, I'm, I'm, do this shit again, you know? <laughs> and, you know, and, and I, because he was, you know, he, that's what I mean, he was like, hey, you know, something about, I know what I wanted to, I was really into this whole thing of putting a microphone in front of my hollow body guitar. So I had a plane to the amps, and I also wanted uh, to have a microphone to have to have some acoustic. Uh, at the time, I was I was responding. I felt like my I was responding more to my uh, imagination's ear, so to speak, by hearing the acoustic sound of the guitar. It was a very uh, personal thing. Um, and I and and but you know I also, as you well know, have have a bad have that bad habit the habit of kind of humming along. And you know, it's so Tommy was like, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, he's, he's like, yeah, right. Tommy, he's, he's just so old. He's like, man, you, you gotta be. I'm, I'm here. Scoop up, you know. Think, are you are you kidding me? He's like, get this fucking on the truck out of you know, and 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 that you know, and he would you know, like, I'm not having any more of this crap. Press record and play the damn guitar, you know. And so you know, and and, and so, but that was exactly what I needed, and you know, and what and, and what the recording needed, and so. I look back at those experiences, and 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 and, uh, and I'm so grateful because I'm able now, and for years, you know, and, and meeting up and, and going forward, I, I'm able to have a really sort of objective, um, uh, uh, honest, uh, uh, painfully honest approach with myself about you know the validity and the value and you know of of of, of an idea or. Uh, you know, a performance or a combination in a way. Uh, um, and it's not just based on coddling my emotions. 
you know, and, that, and that's, and that's it. And I think that's an important thing for an artist because we, we not only do we coddle our own emotions, we want everybody else to do it too. <laughs> well, I think we're glossing over something that needs to be stressed and that not, there were two recordings made in one night at Rockwood. So it wasn't just your trio recording, but then you were also backing up Camille Thurman. You so have two right. sets of material as well. That was, it was, it was, it, it, you know, it's funny. It, that should reflect in my memory like an epic law an epically long day but it doesn't because it was such a smooth easy um you know i don't know that anybody's ever referred to david as you know as being relaxed and easy going <laughs> but one thing is for sure um he uh he made sure that we had a very relaxed uh calm environment in which to create and and um Regardless of, of the stress, uh, and, and I, I'm aware that there was plenty stress uh, uh, that goes into, into the preparation uh, to make sure that all, because there's no room, there's really no margin for error. When you, you know, when you essentially record a live to two track in, 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 a, in, a, in a way, you know. Uh, and it's a beautiful process, but we did, we actually did a, in a, a complete trio recording and a complete recording as a quartet backing up Camille at one time, you know, one day. Uh, um, and uh, to go through two full recordings of material in essentially what was one take of everything. Sometimes I may have done, I can't really remember if we did a retake of anything, but, that, but if we did it, certainly, it's certainly that nothing plays back in my mind like we did 18 takes of this, but, you know, and so uh, <laughs> it should have been an epic, it should, re, I should, it should reflect as an epic, epically long day, but it doesn't. It, I, I look back, I was like, man, it was great, we had a blast. It was, it, you know what, we could do it again. Uh, and, and there aren't many situations. I just did a recording with some guys at uh, Van Gelder's uh, a few weeks ago, and we only got through, it was a one day session, we'll have to go back in, and we only got through maybe half of the guys' material. But, you know, that was just more of a normal recording day. You, know, you got a band in the studio, a bunch of, bunch of great musicians playing really well written music. And you start at 10 a.m. by 6 o'clock, we're all just like, oh, God, can we get a stretcher, man, down? You know, you know, you know get a man out. You know, and so uh, um, we did a lot. Yeah, I did not mean to gloss over that at all. But I feel like it's, it's, it's because it doesn't, it, I don't remember it as a, as, as a particularly hard day. Which is, which is even more of an endorsement of what we did. Because if, if there was ever a hard day, that should have been it. And one of the things I noticed when I check out your Instagram page, follow what you're up to on socials, is it seems like you're frequently playing with the up and comers and like the next generation. Is that facilitated because of relationships with your son and his friends? Or how does that come to be that you seem to be the, the finding the next man up kind of thing? So I, I um, yes, I mean, you know, my sons and I, uh, I, you know, was fortunate enough to be awarded custody of them, uh, you know, which, which made the best out of, a, of divorce is never great. It was a horrible situation. And so, uh, but they came, uh, we lived in Louisiana, and, and which is where their mother's from. And so they came uh, uh, to live with me here in New Jersey when they were uh, 11 and 8, after we'd been separate, after we'd, we'd, they'd been living there for a few years, uh, three or four years. And so, um, just an amazing time for me, and and I made the best of it for them. Uh, uh, but we, you know, we're very very close, uh, and so part of that because they were interested in becoming musicians, meant that you know I was the you know I was the guy with the SUV pick up you pick up the other guys he wanted to play with. You know, Mark Jr. plays drums and Davis plays piano, and so we get the bass player and get the guys. You know, and and lots you know and and so. Um, uh, it was kind of like, you know, I was a soccer dad, you know, it was kind of pick up, you know, it happened. And, and so, uh, and I'm good with kids, you know, I, I, I love kids and young musicians. And so, uh, especially, you know, because we had to stay interested in something that I was involved in. And um, because also, you know, the advances uh, uh, and the information available to, to young people started to become available to them at the time when my sons were young, you know, YouTube and all, all these avenues and, 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 and venues for, for become, being exposed and learning, being exposed to and learning music and things that we never had when I was a youngster. They were far more advanced in terms of their information and things. So I was able to help them a lot more than you would expect me to be able to help a bunch of teenagers, right? So we, we uh, um, I always maintained uh, uh, an open door policy with young folks. Uh, um, and part of it was just because it was something that came natural to me. But I also, it was something I admired about, about a lot of my heroes. You know, George Benson was like that. Um, Wynton Marcellus was like that. And so I knew Wynton 
And Wynn is not particularly fond of the guitar uh, as an instrument, especially in jazz. Uh, and, he's not, and he's not shy about sharing that. But he liked me and he really uh, uh, supported, appreciated my spirit, uh, my love, my, my desire to become a great jazz guitar player. And he supported me in lots of ways. He used to keep, whenever he needed a guitar player, with the six, with the sextet and then the septet, and then even uh, even with early on in the Lincoln Center days, he would hire me. You know, I'm I'm on a few songs uh, of that that massive um, box set of his final septet recordings at the Vanguard. Um, I'm, I appeared on some soundtracks, the soundtrack work that he did, uh, uh, and his trio, uh, his rhythm section. They backed me. They played on the Marks ones: Marcus Roberts, Reginald Fiore, and Herlin O'Reilly. Uh, uh, and so um, Witten has always had, you know, this kind of open door policy with young musicians. Uh, um, and so he, I remember he would call me when I was, you know, in my young 20s and still living in Brooklyn. He'd say, it's Saturday morning early. What are you doing today? Like, well, you know, bring your guitar, come over here. He'd make me sit with my guitar at the piano. And he'd play things and, and try to uh, internalize the sound of what I was playing. And then we'd go play some basketball. And actually do, you know, and, and uh, it wasn't like anything career-wise was going to come out. It wasn't about that. It was educational inspiration and inspirational for me. And I think for him, he just like he liked to have the opportunity to see the young generation. Just, you know, he was making these, these, these advancements and doing these things with the music and, and, and politically and so forth. But I think he liked the idea. Uh, of, of spreading the seed of you know uh, uh, of, of of his you know of his new platform, and so he and and, uh, and so I you know for me it's a lot less um, it's a lot less goal oriented. I just like the energy and the and, you know and the and the innocent optimism that you get. Uh, you know, young musicians are very judgmental because they they haven't they haven't learned how not to be. That's one thing you know. They, they, they love this, they hate that. They respect this, they don't respect it. You know, the idea that people are young and open everything is just not what, what we do as, as musicians. The better, the best of us, we get, uh, we become a little more open-minded and, and, and flexible as we get older. But we start out extremely idealistic and very focused on what we think is gonna, you know. And so it's nice to see the light bulb go off. And it, you know, when, when it's like, oh, maybe I was wrong about that. I should check that out too, maybe you're right. You know, and, and, and then, um, uh, you know, I'm a slow, I, the way that, I, that I've learned and developed as a musician, even though I, I, had, I started pretty young with my career, I, I, I exist on a slow burn. And so uh, I, when I hear a new style or a new innovation in music, I don't run to jump on it and get in it. But eventually it sort of, it finds its way uh, uh, into, my, into my working vocabulary, into my playing. And I like the challenge of, trying to find a way to put my voice in that music. So I spend a lot of time playing with young guys who, who are doing different things. Uh, and I have no intention of, of recording that music or, or taking advantage of that opportunity. It's just purely for the, you know, for the, for the musical benefit, my musical benefit, and ultimately I grow from it, being able to exist and, 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 um, and, and perform and, and, and produce. Uh, interesting music in different in different in different uh, in different genres and different styles and different situations, um, and it's, and I've and I've grown tremendously in my mind as, over the last fifteen years because of that. And so um, most of these guys I've, I've met through Mark Jr. A lot of them because he you know he's thirty years old now, and so and he, he's and he's, and he's been great as a drummer for a long time. And so playing, you know, playing with uh, guys like Ben Williams and playing with the Revive Big Band and, and getting to know guys, uh, other, the great other young drummers like Kush Abade and Justin Brown. These guys are all people that I know through my son. Uh, and, and then as Davis started coming, coming, coming of age, he's 27 now. And uh, um, he's, and he's, you know, Davis is a, a more of a smalls guy. And, and, and I started spending more time kind of with that music scene and, and playing with him and just watching the guys that he played with and seeing, you know, and, and checking that out. There are so many wonderfully gifted young musicians who also kind of share the same spirit and idea and love for music that I feel like I have. And, uh, um, and I just love calling on them, you know, and it's funny. A lot of a lot of people are like, well, you should, you know, I mean, you know, when we see what we want to see, you, you know, with, with more of, of, you know, guys of your generation or older guys. I'm like, great. So what you're saying is, you want to come out and see a bunch of old guys sitting on stage complaining about their back, <laughs> 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 and I, you know, and, and I'm kind of like, you know, I, I trust me. 
never, you know, while it's great to see us all uh, uh, as older guys, or even when I, you know, like I had a great tour that started this year and it was supposed to, and we lost the last six months of it that our band put together with Kirk Lightsey, uh, Santi Debriano, and Victor Lewis. You know, we played uh, um, at the side door uh, uh, of a Connecticut. We were, playing, we were playing in Blues Alley in DC. We played a week, you know, a couple nights at Smalls and Mesro, and then we were going on the road and stuff, you know, and so, uh, um, the great thing for the great thing about that and that experience was there are three, uh, we, four like-minded musicians where I'm now the baby of the bunch. Uh, and Kirk Lightsey being that, you know, in his eighties is probably still the most creative and forward thinking of all of us. And so it was really nice to have, um, to have a chance or uh, to have the opportunity to have to play up uh, uh, in expectation. To the guy, to the guys that I had hired, like I've got this band of guys that I've hired, but man, and with every note, I know they can care less whose name is on the marquee. It's whether or not they're only going to be impressed if I, if I, if my playing is up to par, you know. And, and that kind of, that kind of pressure, that the bar being high, uh, it it brought it brought me to another level that I, when I look back at some of the videos, things that I posted and things that I, video, the footage that I have from the band, you know, uh, I'm so grateful that I did it. And it's, and it's something that I will continue to, you know, to approach. So you'll see in the future, you'll, you'll continue to see, you know, recordings and situations where I'm playing with young guys, um, guys my age and then guys that are older. And, and, and I don't say guys to just mean men, I just mean musicians. Uh, uh, the other thing is I've also, I tell the story a lot, you know, I, I, uh, Jason Moran invited me to, to join his Betty Carter Jazz Head Faculty at the Kennedy Center a few years ago, you, know, you do a two year stint. And it's just a wonderful program where, you know, musicians come from all over the world and they spend two weeks with a staff, you know, just with a, a, a teaching staff, you know, fully loaded with all, all of, you know, uh, some of the greatest musicians on, each, on, on, on their respective instruments. For two whole weeks, you get, you get a stipend, you get all expenses paid. And then when it's over, you get like a bonus. We, we, the students can come to New York for two weeks and, and stay in a hotel and then check out music and all these things, take lessons and so forth. And uh, for all of the guitar applicants we had, we didn't even have one female guitar applicant. Uh, and certainly not one whose, whose application was taken seriously. And that really bothered me. Uh, and so I, um, and it, it came on the heels of I had just, you know, Terry and Carrington and I, had, we were in school together, so we had a birthday together. She, we had just done a week in trio with Joey D. Francesco at Birdland, and she was talking to me a lot about her gender empowerment uh, school at Berkeley and what she, how she was trying to get that off the ground. And, and it, you know, and it really, uh, it, she sort of planted the seed, you know, and then it hit, it hit home when I did this thing with Kennedy's and that, wow, you know, um, we talk about, even those of us who consider ourselves to be uh, uh, evolved and, and, and fair-minded and forward-thinking in terms of that, we talk about, you know, being willing to hire anyone uh, oh, it, you know, and being enthusiastic about hiring anyone who can do the job. The problem is at the middle school level, we still we still separate because in elementary school kids can do everything you got a girl playing tuba and a guy playing flute but once you get to middle school it's still you know and i played alto saxophone in the in the, in the, in the band and, and bass in the orchestra i remember distinctly what it was like the middle school band directors and orchestra they sent all the girls to play violin and viola all the boys played cello and bass and, and in the band all the girls got flute and clarinet you know and 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 so and and so uh, and, and all the boys got trumpet and trombone and, you know, and the brasses, you know, it's it just, and, and maybe it was just, they felt, you know, it was, and, 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 you know, physical, but the, 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 the emotional impact of that is that you just teach these young girls that these instruments are not for them. And so, you know, on, on, so uh, you, uh, it's got, it takes a very special young woman to, you know, to, to, to hold on to wanting to play the tenor, you know, or, or the trombone or something, you know, trumpet or something, you know, and, and, or the bass or the guitar, you know, and, and feel like they belong uh, in the club, you know, as they get older. And so uh, uh, I've also made a concerted effort to, to be super supportive of a bunch of young women that I see that play guitar and other instruments. And, 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 I'm, and, and uh, I'm going out of my way. To, uh, to interface with them and do things, uh, you know, also, because I, I feel like um, it's easy for us to all sit around and talk about uh, what's, you know, what's, it, what's, who's not, you know, who's not working, what's not going on, what's not fair, what's not equitable. Um, but at times like these, especially when we all have pause and have time, 
I, you know, for all the things that I do to stay busy, I actually have time to take on some of the things that I, that I think are, need to be fixed. And so uh, this is something, another thing that I'm very proud to be a part of. What was it like working with Ann on the Casey Abrams record? Well, uh, uh, you know, Ann is so, you know, Ann is a great musician and I've known her, I met her, uh, her first week in New York as a student when she came here to go to, go, go to Manhattan. Uh, uh, and so, um, uh, her father's a guitar player. And so, uh, we, you know, it's great working with her because she's, because she's, uh, she's, you know, she's also a great piano player. So she, and she has, so she has a lot of musical presence uh, and, and uh, confidence. Uh, um, she's also uh, kind of a firecracker. You know, she, I, you know, I could, you know, she, after a while she got tired of being, you know, being asked to play a certain way. And she, you know, she's just like, well, I mean, it, 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 she's got a lot of, a, a lot of, a lot of, a, a, a lot of backbone and confidence. And, and that's great. She's also very fluid. She's a really fluid uh, um, improviser. And so uh, working with her with Casey was interesting because Casey, um, you know, he's, he's one of those rare people who there's just, you, you realize that just what, he's not old enough to have had time to study all the things that he's capable of doing. He's just, he just, you know, his ear. He plays the bass. He plays guitar. He sings. He he plays all. You know. He he hear he hears music and, and he can reproduce music, uh, in a way that's far beyond what his experience or, or education to suggest he could do. Uh, but he also has. You know. He had the pressure of trying to do a lot, playing bass and sing and deliver these songs, uh, in in a in 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 a very in so in a, in a situation that that's forcing him to be organic. We're not going to produce this. And, do it, you know, take by take or bar by bar, check by, you know, uh, and reconcile these, you know, musicians on either, either side of him who at any point could kind of take over, you know, and so, uh, um, you know, uh, it was really nice and, and was, she was very sensitive. Uh, uh, I think she was in, intuitively sensitive as I was to what his situation was, uh, to how, you know, to what his predicament was. Uh, and I think she, you know, she, she proved uh, her medal in that um, not only did she play great, but she was a really good, a really supportive side piece, you know, and, and uh, you know, side musician, and that, and that was nice. In fact, and the fact that we're old friends, well, we just had to stop laughing and joking long enough to get a take on, you know, get a take on, get something on tape, which is great. Uh, and I know that she, you know, that she's that she's close to David Norman, and, you know, and so and, and you, and you know her well, and so it was nice. It's, I'm sure it was good for him uh, to have someone else who uh, who was calm. And, and sort of at, you know, at ease during the session. Uh, um, and it was, it was you know, all in all, it was a delight for sure. And she also, I think, made Gifton feel like, you know, someone else who, because, uh, um, you know, he showed up and, uh, you know, and, I, and Gifton, Gifton was in my, was, he was in my first class at Betty Carter. He was, uh, I, I met him when he was 17 or 18. Uh, and I identified him uh, right away as, um, a prospect that we, you know, a, a young musician we'd be hearing a lot more from in the near future. And I was really glad to see him uh, uh, on the session. And I think, uh, um, and, and her, you know, her veteran presence a little bit helped him as well. So where can people find what you're up to? Lessons, shows, whenever those are possible. Where can people see what you're up to? So I, uh, I'm, I'm really dedicated Instagram. Uh, 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 I'm too lazy for Facebook and there's just too much going on. Uh, uh, so I do, th so a lot of the things that I do, uh, um, end up there, but most of my posts and my information is generated from Instagram. It's great. Uh, and so I, please follow me at, at, at Mark Whitfield the guitarist. Uh, it's a really long, really long, long handle, but I have a close friend whose name is Mark Whitfield. He's a great photographer and, uh, he's in, in the UK and, and, uh, he, um, he saw, he went to get Mark Whitfield on Facebook, of course, I, I got that. And so he was like, oh no, uh, man, we're gonna, you know, and so he, he's like, well, I'll tell you what, just to show that I'm not, I'm not upset when I come to New York to do a photo session. And so I have this great reel of, of promo shots from years ago that he took. But, uh, um, but as, as I was busy, you know, gloating over how I beat him to my name on Facebook, he grabbed it on Instagram. <laughs> so he's Mark Whitfield, so I had to, so I'm Mark Whitfield, the guitarist. But, uh, 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 that just makes it more specific. And so I, I post previews of shows. I, I'm very uh, 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 diligent in terms of keeping all my information for touring, what 
when they're, when, you know, appearances when there are online appearances, teaching. Uh, I have a new thing coming out on the True Fire Network. The True Fire Guitar Network is a live streaming channel for instruction that you can subscribe to for me. Um, and if you, and, or, and for lessons, I'm teaching mostly through the GMI, the Guitar Mastery Intensive Program, which is also available. You can find all the information on Instagram. But uh, yeah, that's the best way to keep up with me. And also, I like that it's, it's an easy way for people to contact me. So uh, I run that myself. If you reach out to me, you, you, know, you, you, can, you can depend on hearing back from me uh, and, you know, and that kind of thing. And so it's great. That, that's, that's, that's become my new conduit for communication and interaction. All right. Well, thanks for joining us. I hope that uh, the rest of your week is good and you stay healthy. Happy. Amen. Amen. And back at you. Stay safe and healthy. And let's get up in this. Let's get back in the studio as soon as we can and do make some more magic. All right, man. I will talk to you soon. Okay. You take care.